This is kind of an overview. Uh, I was told that this is supposed to be sort of a, you know, pedagogical, at least to some extent. So I'm going to try to explain sort of what kind of research questions we're about and what we're interested in as well. Um, this is going to be based on the work of actually a number of, of great graduate students and postdocs, and actually one undergraduate student, uh, Shinya. Um, so I'm going to kind of point them out as we go through the talk. And so what I'm going to talk about today is um, effective models um, from Claude Monte Carlo. Okay. So this is the outline. Um, so first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about downfolding and what I, at least I view as the objective of this operation, which is basically to take a material and then uh, boil it down, do some ab initio calculations, and out, pull out an effective reduced description of that material, right? So for example, you know, a famous example is, you know, we have the copper oxide uh, planes, and it's often written down that you know, the Hubbard model is a decent approximation of that. Um, we don't actually know that that's true. Um, and, um, and so the question is, how can we know whether that is actually true, or whether that's warranted? Um, so my solution to this, there are a number of solutions to that. Um, the solution that I'm going to present today is uh, called, we call density matrix downfolding, uh, mainly because in the main equations you end up with density matrices. So we call it density matrix downfolding. And it's a way of using high accuracy mini body calculations to systematically derive models, right? So, or at least to sy systematically hypothesis check whether a model does apply to a given material. And um, in doing so, we'll realize that we need really good excited states. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, getting better excited states uh, using variational Monte Carlo, which actually has been used a couple times in this. Um, in this isn't session already, so I won't go too much into detail on that. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's talk first about kind of broad view. So on the one hand, on the left-hand side, we have first principles, right? So we've seen this many times already in this, uh, in this session. And just the thing I want to point out about it, I think Matthew already pointed this out, was that, is that the numbers involved in our first principles Hamiltonian are enormous, right? So one electron-electron interaction is like 30 electron volts, right? Just you're about one atomic radius apart, roughly speaking. And it's like 30 electron volts per electron or even more. And the things that we're interested in, so for example, this superconductivity and so on. Uh, by the way, this is an advertisement for the demo lab in Illinois. This is, we have actually videos showing you how to do the demos. I do this demo pretty often. Um, and, but this is happening on the scale of this puck of material. Well, actually, the superconducting puck is much smaller than that. But on the scale of that um, is, you know, milliev, a few milliev, maybe 10 if it's a really big superconducting gap. And this is happening on the electronic scale. Of course, you have gaps for sure, like 1 eV on the material scale, magnetism, which is like about 0.01. So um, this is a really big gulf, right? We think that all these kind of materials, this is silicon in case anybody is interested, um, we think that all these um, kind of emergent phenomena that we see really do, you know, in principle come from, from here. Uh, actually, not all physicists agree that that's true. There are believers in strong emergence. I am not one of them. Um, but we want to get from there to there. And um, you'll see a lot of people that say that's impossible. I, 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 think, I think we can do it. Um, but I want to see how we can do this in a systematic way. Okay. So we're all actually familiar with this basic concept. Um, so band structures is, is, is a model, right? Band structure is a type of model. So we've all, I think most of us have done a DFT calculation. And most of us have taken, you know, our first principle is Hamiltonian. We've interpreted our Consham eigenvalues as if they were excited state energies. And hopefully atoned for that sin at some point in our lives. And then, um, and then we've uh, written down a band structure, right? And the band structure itself is, uh, is a non-interacting model. And there's a citation, which is cut off. Um, but, uh, but the band structure is a non-interacting model. So out of this actually quite strongly interacting physics, we get out a non-interacting Hamiltonian, right? I just want to point that out. Um, and um, actually in physics, you all a lot of times hear people say something like, well, okay, silicon is weakly interacting. Or they'll say something like, it's not correlated. Well, that's actually not true. Um, so, for example, if you say it's uncorrelated and you go, okay, well, I'll use Hartree-Fock, 
to compute the gap in, in silicon, you get six electron volts, right? It's off by a factor of six. Um, the real gap, in case you don't know, is about 1.1 eV. Uh, that's why we use it for solar cells, right? That's a good number for solar cells. Um, and, and the reason is that in first principles, actually, so the, the interactions in silicon are quite strong, right? You know, the electron electron interaction is quite strong. And they do renormalize, as we say, the, these parameters. And so you go from like six electron volts to one, one electron volt. And actually, you have to do a pretty decent amount of work. Um, you can do QMC or something, or even GW does okay with silicon. Um, you have to do a pretty good amount of work to, to get this number right. And then you end up with a really boring band structure model with the right parameters. And this is like kind of emergence, what we would call emergence there. Um, so that's one, that's one example of a model. And um, I think the real frontier is, um, is kind of these in-between systems. So we have a lot of models, and we have, they, they work in kind of these limits. So one nice example of this is the coupe rates. So the high-temperature superconductors, the things we saw floating around the ring just a bit ago. Um, and uh, this is doping. So you dope these guys. Uh, and when they're undoped, uh, they're antiferromagnetic insulators. Experimentally, it looks like the spectra are pretty well described by Heisenberg-like models, more or less, with some small modifications, possibly. Um, and you can kind of understand that that way pretty well. You can describe the behavior of these systems pretty well over there with these simple Heisenberg-like models. On this other side, this is actually a little bit more controversial. I don't want to really get into it. But um, on this other side, um, at least it's argued, that it's fairly well described by a band model. Right? This is why this metal is there. Um, now there's some arguments about whether it's a strongly correlated metal, blah, 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 okay, whatever. Just to say it's roughly that. And in the middle, we don't know. Right? In the middle, we don't really know. And I don't know what this acronym means. But, um, <laughs> but in the middle, we, we really don't know what kind of model applies to that. And so it's pretty difficult to then understand you know, what is going on in the system? How do we control it? How do we understand how to make other systems that are like that if we don't really have a good picture of how this material works? And by the way, you're not going to, yeah, I mean, David said, like, we can't do coup rates. Like, doing this, getting superconductivity from first principles on this system is, that'll, that'd, be a, that'd be fun, let me tell you. <laughs> because, you know, you have to go out to 20, 30, 40 nanometers to get out the pairing, the, you know, the, the coherence length is that long. So you, need this huge, you would need these huge unit cells on this very highly correlated system. Very difficult to do. Okay. Um, I, think, I think the neural net, even though the neural network wave functions look awesome, you need a few more than 40 electrons to do that, right? Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, we're not there. We can't do it with Slater Jastrow either, right? So, um, okay. So, and in general, what we found, um, this is some work with a postdoc of mine a couple years ago. Um, we tried to see, okay, well, based on this intuition that this is sort of an in-between thing. You, you don't have, like, isolated spins. You don't have isolated charge excitations. Somehow everything is sort of mixed up. Can we find a descriptor that describes this? And um, what we came up with was we, uh, and I don't want to go into the details, but we changed the spin, so we kind of lock, change, do different spin orderings, broken symmetry orderings. So we kind of force our calculation into different spin orderings. And then we look at how the density, the electron density changes. In a really boring antiferromagnet, that won't change at all, right? So something like manganese oxide, uh, the density doesn't depend on which way the spins are pointed. But in something like the cuprates, actually, um, where are the cuprates there, uh, they actually do. Uh, it do it does, it's, they're actually quite closely coupled. And, um, and what we found is that in general, uh, this is, these are different like ground states. And what we had was the, the conventional ground states are blue and the unconventional ground states, meaning like something that's not easily described by a simple model, right, this kind of the idea, are in green. And for the most part, if there is a big coupling between spin and charge, uh, they have you know, unconventional ground states. Not all, but most. For the most part, that's true. Um, and so it seems like some of these like, so-called strongly correlated materials are, are interesting materials, somehow has something to do with the fact that their models are somewhat non-trivial, right? They're not, I mean, maybe that's an obvious statement, but, um, but there's some numbers to kind of back that up. Okay, 
Um, and so we have lots of models. Um, so the problem is not a lack of options. There are many, many models. Um, I just put a few. I just want to point out that something like an atomic force field, at least in my picture, is very, very similar to something like a tight binding model or something like a spin model. So our framework is going to teach, treat these all kind of on the same footing. And hopefully you'll see that by the end. Um, but we have all these sorts of models, and we don't know which one should apply to these types of materials, if any, at all. So we want to do some hypothesis checking. OK. OK, so what's the current state of the art in doing this? I'm going to demonstrate using capybaras. Um, so <laughs> so, um, so this is, th these are meant to, um, to represent an experimental observation, right? So experimental observation is that we see the mommy capybara and the baby capybaras, and, um, and they're in the water. And that might be an observation, uh, you know, this is actually one that was recent, right? A zero energy mode, right? A, z a mode at the, at the Fermi level, right? And we see this, that experimentally you see this, this observation. And then the theorists come along and we, we, we provide a model that fits the data. Um, <laughs> so, now this does work, right? It's kind of consistent with the data. So you know, it's not wrong. And you'll see it in the, and you see it in the, in the papers, right? You see, we saw a signature of capybara bicycles. Um, which is their head sticking out at the different heights, right? Um, and it's true, it's consistent, but maybe there are other alternatives. And it's rarely done. Um, and by the way, the reason I mentioned Majorana and zero energy is because recently, there was, you know, a few years ago, there was reporting of these zero energy modes, which were supposed to be signatures of Majorana excitations. And then it turns out they're probably not it, right? So that's, that's, that's a recent example where that happened. And it happens, it's okay. But, um, uh, uh, but this is something that happens kind of quite a lot. So we want to try to improve that a little bit. Um, so this is the kind of question we want to answer. We want to answer, um, you know, say we have a coup rate, say we have some material, is, is, it, is it actually described by this model, right? So is this hypothesis that this describes the low energy excitations of the system correct? I want to also contrast that with, again, this is the capybara thing um, of I have my effective Hamiltonian, does it give the same phase diagram, right? So it's a different logical statement, uh, so to speak, if that makes sense. Um, and so this is a useful question to ask. I, I don't think this is not a useful question to ask. I, it's just a different question than we're trying to answer here. Okay. So there's actually this very simple fundamental principle that you can use to try to, um, try to determine this. Um, it's really, really simple. So all you really need to do is you need to take your, this, this block is my Hamiltonian, right? It's just my Hamiltonian, my many-body Hamiltonian matrix. And what I want to do is I want to separate it out to have zeros here, zeros here. This is the high energy space. This is the low energy space. And I want to describe that operator. That's it, right? That's all I really want to do. That's all these models are really trying to do, right? And you might be familiar with this. This is, uh, uh, if people are familiar with the schreifer wolf transform, that's what that's trying to do, is doing it perturbatively. Um, but, uh, but that's, in principle, all, all we want to do. And, um, and so this is something we already do. This is why we are so interested in eigenstates to begin with, right? Because the eigenstates are going to be the, the vectors that span this particular, this particular operator here, right? The low energy eigenstates. So that gives you an algorithm. You find the low energy eigenstates, you write out H, right? This is not anything that should be new. Um, but the problem with that is that, well, now I have my many body wave functions. I have my expression of, of my effective Hamiltonian in terms of these many body complicated wave functions. And then what happens if I want to scale my system up by a factor of two? Right? How do I go up there? And it's not so easy to do. Say I wanted to do a phase transition. And then the other thing is, you know, well, it's not very easy to understand. You have these kind of mini-body wave functions, and you're trying to figure out what's going on in them. Um, and, so, uh, and so we kind of want to, what we want to be able to do is, let's suppose we can solve this, right? So what I'm going to do for, for the moment is just suppose I can find the low-energy eigenstates. How would we then take those guys and put them into a model, right? Let's suppose we can do that. How do we make a model out of them? Maybe that's a better way of saying it. 
Um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to say, is that we have this. Let's suppose we have this. How do we know if this is a good approximation to that? Right? How do we know if this is a good approximation to that? How do, we know if, how do we know which one is a good approximation to it? I just want to note some ground rules for this. <clears throat> um, there's no guarantee that there's just two-body interactions. In general, it should be higher. Um, even if the original Hamiltonian has one, has, has one body interactions. Interestingly, it's, it seems like many cases you can get away with just one and two body interactions. But there's no guarantee. <clears throat> there's no guarantee that it's simple. Um, uh, the simple, don't worry about that third one. Uh, just ignore it. Um, and um, typically, you know, as I was saying, models chosen in hopes of representing experiments but what I want to do is go the other way and say, okay, we have data. Let's see if the model, model does that. So the big questions are, how do we know if a given model applies? And how do we know where to truncate in so that we have a decent model? Okay. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay, so I think it's best done <clears throat> with an example. And so I'm going to go to the hydrogen chain, which I think about half the talks have referenced at this point. Uh, so, so let's look at these wonderful results um, and so from this paper. And, um, and so we have here, uh, they have an antifermitic insulator, and there's a metal insulator transition, uh, which, by the way, diffusion Monte Carlo seems to de describe quite fine. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and then it becomes these ferromagnetic domains and so on. Okay. So there's some magnetism kind of throughout. Um, it's antifermitic over here. So my question to you all, um, there's a quiz. Uh, at what distance here would you be comfortable using a Heisenberg model to describe the low energy excitations? So just looking at this, what would you think? So who thinks anything above 8, 0.8? Who thinks that? Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Nobody? How about above 2? Good with that? 2? Okay. Um, well, I kind of wanted, how about, how about 2.4? <laughs> uh, 2.8? Above 3? It has to be above 3 to be good? Okay. Uh, robot. What's the answer? The robot answer. Okay, robot says above 3. Okay, it has to be above 3 to be good. Okay. And, and why above 3? I'm guessing you're looking at the magnitude. Right, you want to say more than both. <laughs> right? Were you just voting or did you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just voting. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy that went up, actually. <laughs> when I was chairing yesterday, I was like hoping it would go up at some point. Um, but yeah, so I think that's very reasonable. Like, I think it's very, re and, and you probably, what I would do at least, is I would look at the magnetization and see, you know, you probably need it to be close to, this is in Bohr magneton, so you want it to be close to one, right, you would think. Um, before an Heisenberg model would be reasonable. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind. So let's think about how you might do it. Let's suppose you were very optimistic. Um, somebody said two. I'm not going to call you out, but um, and uh, and you said, you know what? Let's 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 just assume that it works, right? And so the typical kind of mode of operation is that you would you would you know okay, well I'm going to assume it's a Heisenberg model is true, and um, and I'm going to do a nail state, right? So I'm going to break symmetry and do up, down, up, down, up, down. And I'm going to do a ferromagnetic state uh, in my DFT. And the energy should be this and this if I counted correctly, which is possible I didn't. And um, I'm going to compute this ferromagnetic and this nail states in DFT. And then I can you know, take this difference and solve for J. And I see that, oh, OK, J is increasing. And I can um, plot that out. And of course, I think many of you already have anticipated some of the problems with this. Um, now, these S's can be, could be quite different for the two states, right? Um, so like, what spin are you going to, A, what spin are you going to assign to the ferromagnetic one? There's a lot of slop in that, right? Like, should I use S squared equal to 1 half? Should I, should I take this number? But that'll be different for the ferromagnetic state. There's a lot of questions there. And the other problem is that the antifermitic ground state actually doesn't even mean that the spin models work, right? There's nothing that says that having antifermitic correlations means that you have a spin model excitation, right? But you, you can't really get that out of this because you just kind of assumed that it was right. Okay, so how do we do this better? Um, 
so this is, this is our density matrix downfolding. And what we view it as is, is that's a hypothesis, right? So we have this um, effective Hamiltonian. H effective is, is J, S, I, S, J. I drop the sums because I'm lazy, just so you know. Just assume you sum over everything that's repeated, Einstein summation. Um, and it's actually fairly easy to prove um, that uh, this will actually be true if for every eigenstate in my you know, set of low energy eigenstates, um, the two operators are equal, right? So I have my first principles Hamiltonian, and my, I have my effective Hamiltonian, and I have you know, I and J, so all. So this is just saying like the two operators are the same operator if the matrix elements are all the same. So yeah. the, the phi's on the left are nothing like the phi's on the right. Yeah? They sort of map onto them, but they're different uh -huh. things. Yeah, so the proof would be like one sentence long if you didn't have to think about that, and it would be, it's like a page long because you have to think about that, right? Um, so yeah, you have to be a little careful about Hilbert spaces and so on, right? Now luckily, you can make this operator an operator on your ab initio Hilbert space. And the way you do that is by making a basis, right? Um, and so that's what we do, right? So it's, it's pretty okay in that sense. But then you have to be careful about like your, actually that's an important point, um, which I could talk about maybe too much, um, about how you have to make sure that your, um, part of the hypothesis is the Hilbert space. It's not just the form of the Hamiltonian. I think that's maybe a better way of saying it, right? When you write down a Hamiltonian, you have to also write down the Hilbert space the Hamiltonian is operating on because we're doing still linear algebra, right? And, um, and so you need to make sure that Hilbert space somehow matches up with the, with the space that you're your subspace, right, in some way. Um, but yeah, so you, you're absolutely right. Um, then we take this expectation value of SI and SJ. We have to decide what these S's mean in my ab initio. In our particular case, we use these intrinsic atomic localized orbitals, um, and, um, and we use that as part of the basis. But what I wanted to say is that this basis is part of the hypothesis, right? So when I write down something like this, it's really a collection of hypotheses of, with different projections, right? And ultimately, you're going to have to judge based on the fit. Um, but we've worked it out in such a way that we compute our one and two RDMs in a basis big enough, you know, a big enough basis, and so we can test different hypotheses by just rotating them. So we don't have to do extra calculations to try different bases. Um, okay, but fortunately we've often found that like sensible bases just kind of work, right? So, okay, so what you're trying to do, just this, this is kind of a, a, a sketch, um, what you're trying to do is you have some data, so you have your ab initio data, and so you have uh, your ground state and maybe your first excited state just to show. Um, and uh, this is the energy, this is the energy expectation value, E1, E0, and E1. And it looks kind of like that. This is your original Hamiltonian. And what you're trying to do is just change your x-axis such that, for example, if I was doing a tight binding model, um, that it's a straight line. Right? Because this predicts that J. I should have put SISJ, sorry about that. But, um, but this predicts that J is a linear function of this expectation value. The energy is a linear function of this expectation value. So if you're looking for a model like this, um, where you have kind of a, a linear combination of operators and parameters, uh, then you're looking for linear functions of expectation values of parameters. Nobody said that this is possible but this is what you're looking for if you want that kind of model to, to be there. Okay, um, and so you're looking, yes? Hey, just a quick question, I, maybe I wasn't paying enough attention. Do these things actually have to be eigenstates or do they just have to span sort of the low energy space? Yeah, these, sorry, not the same one. yeah thanks Brian. Um, yeah, they, they just have to span. Yeah, so it doesn't matter as long as they just span the low energy space. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I made that, I've made that point before and it confused people, so I stopped making that point, but yes, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, okay, and so the, here's an example. This is kind of an older example of, of getting this to work on benzene. So for example, for benzene, we, we have these orbitals here. These are our pi type orbitals, and we might look at a type binding model. So you can try to just do a nearest neighbor type binding model. This is diffusion Monte Carlo energy for different approximate excited states. 
This is the fitted energy for that model. You can see it's not a great fit. You would like the points to sit on the line. Each one of these points is a different wave function, right? It doesn't quite fit in the line. Sorry if it's small. Um, if I add an interaction, then it gets quite a lot better. Um, and then I can add in like density-density interactions, and it gets even better. I can add in more, and it gets even better, right? And um, then we can go and solve that, and we can compare it to experiments, and it actually agrees to the experiment to within, you know, about a tenth of an EV or so. Um, the one that we should look at here is uh, the green one, or the, the black one. Those are our good ones, and they're sitting pretty much right on top of the experimental line. This should be the experimental excitation, not, not gap, but um, anyway. And uh, the PPP, oh no, that's a literature re reference, so that's a little bit worse. So, so it kind of works. Um, at least it's proof of concept. Uh, we've also done it for graphene, uh, and you can get the, um, I didn't show it here, but you can get the uh, uh, Fermi velocity out of that. That way, um, we also compared it to CRPA, which is kind of the current state of the art for these sort of things. And we get a little bit weaker on-site interactions than CRPA does. We think that's uh, maybe we have a little bit of extra screening than you would get in RPA. OK. Um, so let's go back to our hydrogen chain. Uh, so this is done by Yu Ching, uh, Cheng, my senior in my group, who's just about to graduate. Um, and this is pretty recent stuff, so this is pretty new. So she's going to look at uh, R greater than 2 for the hydrogen chain. Uh, we're looking at eight atoms. The finite size errors are pretty small at eight atoms for, for this size. As soon as you hit 1.8 or so when you get the metal, then suddenly the finite size errors are huge. But for, um, for the, the larger size, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty OK. We checked. I'm not going to show you how we checked. Um, just no pseudo potential, nothing. And we're going to use two different ways of generating excited states. We're going to use uh, CAS SCF, uh, which is 8-8. Eight, eight. So we have our eight 1s orbitals, and we're exciting eight electrons in them. Um, that's what that 8-8 eight, eight means. And we're going to use a variational Monte Carlo as well. So we have a Jastro as well. OK, so let's see how we, how we apply this. So um, let's suppose, you know, I asked you guys, tell me if the Heisenberg model works. And so let's look at R equals 3.2. And, um, and uh, so our hypothesis is that the effect of Hamiltonian is Jij Si to Sj. Um, as I mentioned, it's true if these two are equal to each other. And so what we really should do is plot the energy as a functional psi. And it should uh, be linear in SISJ where I'm summing over all the SISJs, right? All these correlation functions. And this is what we get. So these are about 400 excitations uh, out of CAS SCF. Um, nice thing about doing hydrogen. And, um, and what you see is this really interesting thing where we have this beautiful line, and then we have this giant mess up here, right? Um, and you can also look at the line. We've also colored it by double occupancy. This is average double occupancy. So uncorrelated wave function would be an average double occupancy of 0.25, right? A quarter of the time you have two electrons on the same site. Um, and so you can see that there's this nice line here where the antiferromagnetic has a bit more double occupancy than the ferromagnetic, as, as one would expect. But in general, it's quite a bit lower than all this. So these are kind of our charge excitations, and these are spin excitations. And it does turn out that there is a subspace. These are all eigenstates, but there is a subspace in which uh, this Heisenberg model does apply. So it's pretty clearly visible there. Uh, so we can do this for a bunch of different uh, radii. And this is the one I showed you to begin with. And you can see this really nice, clean separation of a Heisenberg model for these low energy excitations. Oh, by the way, J is enormous in the system. Um, so I don't know if that's useful for anything, but it's, it's, it's gargantuan. Um, the slope is J, right? And then as R goes down, what we start to see is that the spin excitations sort of start to merge into the charge excitations, right? And that's exactly what, um, that's, that's great, actually, because that's exactly what I was interested in from the very beginning, right? I was interested in where, you know, we don't have a clear spin charge excitations, but we can kind of read it right off here. And, you know, I mean, 
I think we're all kind of comfortable now that when you're fitting a model, you always have to ask yourself, well, how comfortable am I with these errors or that error, right? Like it's never perfect, right? So you might say this is pretty, this feels pretty clean, but if you look very, very closely, the slope is not a constant, right? But if maybe if you look closer here, you'll see this, the slope starts to kind of bend. Yeah. So this is nearly a 1D system, yeah? Is this Luttinger liquid physics? Is that what we're seeing, or is it something completely different? Yeah, that's a... I don't believe it's Luttinger liquid because it's, uh, because it's a ferromagnet, right? Because Luttinger liquid, you need, uh, no, you need zero energy charge excitations too, right? Or no? Sure. I'm not entirely sure on that. It, it, it did cross my mind. If you have more ideas, I'd be very interested to no, know. I don't know. I only really know the words. Okay. <laughs> Would open boundary conditions affect it or not? So the open boundary conditions don't affect, we've checked this with, with periodic as well. Yeah. It doesn't really affect this at, at this radius, but at small radii, it does, it does affect it. At small, smaller distances. I don't imagine maybe the ones at the ends are pinned. And then did you say this was six? Is that what it was? It's what eight, yeah. Eight. Yeah. There's higher order corrections where it doesn't because the anti-flamagnet Right. Right, and there, but there is like a distinction between whether that's whether that would be included in this model. Like, it might just appear in. So what, what she always said, she said it kind of quietly. So I'll try to repeat it. Um, he's saying that when you have open boundary conditions, you end up getting this algebraic decay um, from the from the edges. Um, so. Um, I don't know if, I'm not, we didn't notice a difference, so we can, you know, do individual J's or something like that. We didn't see any evidence for individual, a, a change in J, right? What would be interesting to look at would be whether the Heisenberg model with open boundary conditions just would have that too. Do you know if that's the case? I think it is. If you do a large enough system, yeah. you know, slow drift, the, it's not a constant. Right. It doesn't have too long in order. It right. Order. So, Right, so I'm fitting a Heisenberg model to this, and then when I solve the Heisenberg model with open boundary conditions, I would just get that out as far as a ground state, right? So that's how that would work. Um, but yeah, these are all hypotheses that we can then kind of check, right? That's kind of the point, yeah. Um, at least I believe that would be the, the case there. Um, yeah, um, we do actually get a little bit, this is actually, um, it's actually well known that you get a little bit of change in the slope uh, that's a frequency dependent. J, this is something that happens. Um, but you see it does sort of merge in there. And kind of frustratingly, it looks like at very low energy, and probably if we went to bigger sizes, we would get more points in here, you can still kind of like sort of describe some of the very low energy ones as sort of like looking spin. But you can see the double occupancy is starting to get big too, so it's kind of, kind of unclear. But I kind of, we kind of come up with an answer, um, depending on how comfortable you are with cutting cutting your edges, maybe at 2.8 or 3.0, we have pretty clear spin-like excitations. Yeah? Uh, isn't the, the idea of double occupancy already dependent on your basis set, sort of? Yeah. I mean, you, you could say, well, maybe the atomic states would spread over more than one site or something. Yep. Yeah, you, you, you can change your basis, and then the picture can look quite different, right? And, Question over there. Yeah. I guess it's related. To, why is it that the low energy has higher double occupancy? Oh, it's it's antiferromagnetic. So the, the reason that the lower energy has higher double occupancy, you know, so it's it's just just super exchange, right? So if I have you know up here and up down, I can do, do, and then I get some double occupancy there. That's yeah. this virtual. Uh, yeah, it's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So that, that's kind of how we can answer, answer that question. So I would not have come up with this answer at all, but that's kind of what we get to. Um, okay, so at low energies, at very low energies, it does kind of look similar to a spin system, but, it, but one thing I sh you should note is that the ground state of the, um, this is actually getting back to the, the Hilbert space comment, you know, the ground state of, of the Heisenberg model actually has this descriptor pretty, pretty negative, right? 
um, do the antiferromagnetic, and it actually comes up a bit over here. So if you did fit a, a Heisenberg model to this, then it would actually still find a ground state which is all the way down there somewhere, and, um, and that wouldn't really match our data. So you have to be kind of careful about this. Um, that's why I say ground state is the wrong place. Um, so. so this procedure, I mean, this is something that I think it would be really nice to talk to applied mathematicians about because this is very far from automatic, right? There's a lot of considerations you have to make when you're doing this, right? Like things like, you have to think a, a lot. Um, yeah, okay. Um, we can also do things like check a non-interacting hypothesis. So for example, we can put in hoppings, um, different, different links of hoppings, T1, T2, T3 model. And, um, and we can look at the R squared, so that's the goodness of kind of like a explained variance in a fit. So it's roughly speaking, when it's one, you've explained all the data, and if, if it's zero, you've explained none of it. And, um, and you can see that as we start to pull in, it gets a little bit better, right? It gets a bit closer to sort of a non-interacting hypothesis model. Of course, it's not perfect, right? And so we can start to say maybe this is something like a decent model for itinerant type magnetism where you could start with the band structure and then modify it, possibly. Um, now, if we add interactions, then our R squared just sits near one. So if we do a Hubbard model there. Um, so interactions are important throughout. Um, and this is what it looks like when you have two parameters. So now I have, um, this is a Hubbard model. So this is just uh, T1 and, and, and U here, the things multiplying. And then this is the energy expectation value. And if you can squint and kind of try to understand this 3D graph, this sits on a plane, right? And so if we want to go, and this is something I don't know how to do, but in general, like how to identify a, like a, a bounding lower plane out of a mess on top, and it's, it's tricky. But, um, but that's kind of what you're looking for when you're doing this sort of thing. So hmm. the yeah. Inversion, that's for a yeah, so, um, yeah, I mentioned this at the top. Um, so way back at the beginning, the Schreifer-Wolf, Schreifer -Wolf or Schreifer-Wolf, I don't know, um, is trying to get your Hamiltonian basically into this form, right? Um, usually perturbatively, at least the, the versions that I'm familiar with. The um, focuses up on yeah, they try, you're trying to decouple it, but you're doing it perturbatively, right? So the problem with Schreifer Wolf is that you need a reference which is reasonably close to the right place, right? Whereas this, this is um, completely non perturbative because you're doing, you're just finding the energy eigenvalues through quantum chemistry or quantum Monte Carlo or something like that. Yeah. But it's the same basic idea. Yeah. Um, also, if you, keep, if you push Schreifer-Wolf too far, you will get, so one thing this will do, which is kind of interesting, is it'll actually renormalize your parameters. So for example, a lot of times when you're doing kind of, when you're working directly on the Hamiltonian, say you're doing canonical transformation or Schreifer-Wolf or something like that, maybe variational, I'm not sure what variational Schreifer-Wolf is to be honest with you, um, but if it's anything like a canonical transformation, what you end up getting is like four body terms and six body terms and so on. And um, a lot of times those can be absorbed into a two-body interaction, like a renormalized re two-body interaction. Um, and it's hard to see that if you work directly with the Hamiltonian. But if you do it in a data analysis sort of way, it kind of just gets absorbed in. Actually, if you look here, so here we have a U, which is four, right? We have just a T and a U, we have four, right? Now, there are actually longer range interactions, and we can see if we fit to the longer range interactions, they have a VO1 and a VO2, then we do get a better fit, right? But look what happened to our U. It went up to almost 11, right? Why did that happen? That happened because what really matters is U minus V, right? And I know it's small, but U is 11 and V is 7, and 11 minus 7 is about 4. So what really matters is like how, you know, for an electron, how much does it cost for me to be here versus over there? Like to first order, that's the main thing. And, um, and so by fitting, you can kind of get this renormalization automatically. 
Whereas if you did like a transformation on the Hamiltonian, then you, if you just drop this term, then you would get like 11 and you'd be like, what happened, you know? Um, or you have to know to renormalize it in that way, right? But this kind of comes out automatically. I mean, so actually, um, for that sort of thing, uh, Tim Welling has a paper on this for, for CRPA, this exact problem. Okay, um, cool. Uh, where were we? Okay, so we can kind of generate these maps which did not come up in color at all. Uh, so, <laughs> so we can kind of generate these maps where we have a single band Hubbard model, which kind of seems to work pretty well from two on up. And we have very good reasons to believe that below two it doesn't because the 2s and 2p start to come into play. So that's probably going to stop working out. And then um, uh, the Heisenberg model uh, uh, works pretty well out here. This is supposed to be kind of green. This is supposed to be kind of red. This is supposed to be kind of green. This is supposed to be kind of red. And the non-directing model starts to get better as we get smaller and so on. So this hopefully you know, aligns with your intuition in terms of what should work, but we actually can kind of put numbers on these things. That's the idea. Okay, so all this is really dependent on our underlying states being accurate, right? If our states are not accurate, then your, 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 your conclusions are only as good as your data. So we need to get to, um, we need to have better data. And so uh, this is, goes to our other thing, which is uh, uh, generating low energy wave functions, which really means excited states, right? Uh, in variational Monte Carlo. And, um, we're going to use, we wanted to use the multi-slater Jastro uh, because it's much cheaper than other things and we had it implemented. Uh, it's actually a pretty good ansatz. Um, so if you, especially if you fully optimize the orbital coefficients of CI, everything. Um, and so for example, this is, an undergrad actually did this with our code. And you can see uh, this is for hydrogen chain and it's energy per atom um, versus number of determinants. And I think Claudia showed a, a graph similar to this. Um, where you can see that even at variational level, you can uh, converge quite well um, with, you know, a thousand <coughs> determinants or so. Right? So it's pretty efficient. If you just have the determinants, this is uh, Hebath CI, then you need a lot of determinants before you get too close because the Jastro is doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. What, what's the system? Hydrogen chain. Yeah. Uh, but this is generally... I mean, this sort of thing is, most systems do this, more or less, yeah. I mean, the DMC is exact, which is, you know. Yes, yeah. So there's very little node or error in the hydrogen chain, yeah, yeah. Um, although the changes in DMC tend to be, I mean, pretty small on the level of everything else anyway, yep. Um, okay, and so we came up with this method, um, which, <laughs> um, is not really that new, but as far as I know, hasn't really been applied to, hadn't, before we, 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 we implemented it, it hadn't really been applied in, in BMC as far as I've seen. Um, we do orthogonalization, right? And so the basic idea here is that you uh, found, find your best approximation to the ground state, we call that psi naught. And um, I think the best way to understand this is that if I make a graph of, um, of the overlap of an arbitrary wave function with psi naught, that can be at most one, um, well, if you square it, it can be minus one, and um, it can be at a, a minimum zero, right? And the minimum possible energy is E naught. Uh, obviously, that's the ground state energy. And the minimum possible energy with zero overlap is the first excited state energy, right? And it's quite easy to prove that this is a lot, the, there's a lower bound, which is a line connecting these two. Right, because it's just a linear function. So, um, if you add a penalty to that overlap, then you can lift this line up, and you can make the global minimum the uh, first excited state. Uh, so, there are a lot of technical issues with this. Uh, it's, it's not a very complicated idea, but um, there are a lot of technical issues with this involving norm. I've talked to some people here about this, um, which we talked about in the paper. Um, we can talk about it in depth. Actually, um, as we were talking about optimizing, if you try to optimize them all at once, there are actually some really subtle things that go on there. Um, and so most of what we've done has been, you optimize the ground state, then you get the first excited state, 
second, third, fourth. And that's what I proved, that's what we have the proofs for. We know how to do that correctly. Okay. Um, and this matters. Um, so for example, this is a carbon monoxide molecule. This is a, a new student of mine, Kevin, who did this work. Um, so for the ground state, uh, this is optimi keeping the orbitals fixed from hartree fock versus optimizing. The ground state doesn't really matter, right? The orbitals are pretty good from hartree fock um, If this is a CAS, a CAS plus, um, uh, plus Jastro. But for the excited state, even if you have a, you have, you have a small CAS, then if you optimize the orbitals, uh, you get a lot, a whole lot of energy for the excited state, right? So the orbitals, I think, um, uh, this was mentioned before as well, that the orbitals were quite bad for the excited state oftentimes, like much, much worse than, um, than for the ground state. And it can look like it's highly, like needs a lot of determinants when actually just your orbitals need to be fixed. And that's about 0.2 EV, and then that ends up being quite close to experiment. Um, so that, that, that is, is really useful. Uh, we also applied it to benzene. Um, and uh, it gets accurate results. I'm not going to bore you. Uh, by the way, this is all implemented in our code, PyQMC, um, which is simple access to QMC methods. Uh, so it's all Python. You can get in there. You can get your hands dirty. Uh, this is an example of if you want to compute a dipole, you can actually do it inline. This is the, the code that runs the calculation. So you can, you can actually write your own like accumulator and just pass it right in, and it will, um, and it will like accumulate whatever thing you want to do. So any expectation values you want to do, you can kind of do it externally. So it's a pretty uh, flexible thing. Um, another way in which people have used this code, um, since it's very simply written, is they have read the code and then implemented their own versions based on that, <laughs> which is great. I'm happy to help anyway. Uh, just please. No, no. <laughs> No, I think it's good. I think that's what open source is about. Um, just, just cite it whenever we, we publish a paper. I mean, we'll try to put out a paper so you guys can cite it. Um, it also works on GPUs. And really, I'm happy. Like, I mean, that's the point of open source, right? You can look at it, and you can see. And, but if you can contribute back, that would be even, even quite wonderful as well. Um, we have implemented on GPUs. We don't get the best performance, but we do get a speed up. Um, these are on Summit cores, uh, so 42 cores versus six GPUs. And we get like two or three uh, speed up for, for large enough systems. So it's not too bad, um, but uh, you know, it, it works at least. OK, so I'm almost done. Uh, so back to the hydrogen chains. So we can get VMC and, and get the parameters back again. And so what you'll see is that so this state here kind of got optimized down to this one. So interestingly, I don't know what to think about this, to be honest. I just saw this result yesterday. Um, but the uh, spin spin correlation function actually went down quite a bit um, when we get to VMC uh, and didn't do much here because it's already sort of in the Heisenberg regime at R equals three. Um, and everything kind of moved down. But what you'll note is that the slopes change a little bit, but they don't change a lot. That's kind of what you would expect for hydrogen, that the physics is basically right at a cast level. Like the correlations are not going to change it that much, the Jastro correlations. Um, the energy goes quite down. Um, but we can kind of demonstrate that it, that it is certainly possible to do. And that's kind of nice to see. Um, we do start to run out of steam at about like 10 or so eigenstates. So that's something to keep in mind. 10 or 20, I guess. OK, um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, so I think I said a lot of stuff. But uh, the one thing is that I'm excited about is the hydrogen chain. It really has some of that in-between nature, um, and I think is we're still thinking about it. I'm not sure how to describe like this region other than Hubbard bottle, which is actually quite a bit of a reduction from ab initio, but um, not as much as I, I guess I would like. Um, and um, we, don't, we don't know if, if, if that's something better or there's some other features that we could pull out. Um, and one thing I note is that, and maybe the applied mathematicians can have some thoughts on it. Hopefully I've explained it well enough that you understand the problem. Um, you know, we've been doing this feature extraction by hand. Like we look at it and we say, oh, look, these guys look like spin excitations. Let's use those, right? And is there any way, you know, are there better ways to kind of take this data and sort of try to extract out what the right manifolds are for different things? I, I don't know. Um, and there's lots of other interesting questions about going further than just linear models and so on. There's a lot of things we can do. Um, 
And uh, just to finish, uh, other stuff my group has been working on, uh, QMC methods. Um, I want to note, um, by the way, if you guys are not aware, um, uh, Sandra Shirella also has some papers on this. Those of you who are optimizing these functions, um, just be aware that the parameter derivative has infinite variance um, of, your, of your local energy. And so um, we talk about it in this paper, but other people, like Sandra Svella has done work on this. Other people have done work on this. I mean, we're not the only ones who did. But just read it if you haven't, because so, it can make your optimizations much more quick. <laughs> so, uh, so we've also done benchmarks. Uh, I've actually, I'm also an applications person, so I'd be love to talk about, I actually have a paper now on dark matter detection which is so cool. Uh, I didn't do anything, but it was really cool to be part of it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we also have uh, developed type binding models actually from DFT, um, sort of machine learning type binding models from DFT um, that are way better than the state of the art. And we've also done some, some other applications. So if you want to ask me about that, please feel free to. Thank you.